to be here tonight. It's good to have everybody with us here. Praise the Lord. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask you a question here. And uh, you, you just answer it how you feel led, how you feel like the Lord might be leading you, what your understanding is, and so on. Um, let's see here. We already went through the 40 days deal uh, in Acts chapter 1. And um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And um, I mentioned to you last Wednesday uh, these two verses of Scripture, and we'll get into them a little bit, where John the Baptist um, is baptizing people and he says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and then it says, and with fire. And he says it again in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then it goes on, it says, his, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly or throughly, which basically means same thing, throughly and thoroughly, purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with, un, with fire unquenchable. Now I want you to think about all these things here tonight, because I'm going to ask you the question in a little bit, um, what does it mean to be baptized with fire? What does it mean to you? And um, there, there really isn't, um, don't, worry about, um, don't worry about giving the wrong answer, okay? I, I already know that Roy's going to do that for you, so anything, no, I'm just kidding. Any, <laughs> anything else would be okay. No, um, just kind of tell me what you think that means to be baptized with fire, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and good to, good to have you with us tonight. And, um, you know, I'm going to say this right now, and I'm not going to make a, a whole lot out of it. Um, we, we had a, this is just typical of how God does things around here. Um, I didn't mention to anybody, in fact, I didn't know myself until late Sunday afternoon, but what Michael was going to... Uh, plan to do a feeding this week, starting tomorrow, uh, there in Turkana, and uh, we try to feed uh, around two to 3,000 families, um, and like I said, the, the cost of it, it went from, um, when we first started doing it, about $4,000, moved up to $5,000, and then, uh, praise Biden, and the rest of the world, or whatever. Anyway, now it's costing us about nine grand to feed the same amount of people. I did not tell anybody, and I didn't know myself, that we were doing a feeding this week. Michael came into my office uh, Sunday afternoon um, after the afternoon service and said that, um, that they were planning on doing a feeding this week. Uh, starting tomorrow, and um, he usually tells me that so we can uh, transfer the, whatever money we have over to the Hope Foundation bank account, and then they can purchase the food from that. What he didn't know was about two hours before he told me that someone had donated and covered the whole feeding, one donation. They didn't know. They didn't know that we were going to, because I, I didn't announce it, and I didn't know myself. And um, that's not the only time that's happened here. God has been very, very good um, to our church, to all of us people, and then all of, all of the extended Bethel. I never, ever think of our extended church family as being uh, lesser 
than the rest of us here. In fact, we had a visit a little while ago from a family that's been following us for quite a while. And uh, I recognized his name because he calls every now and then and I talk to him and I, I, enjoy, I enjoy talking with him, fellowship with him on the phone and visiting with him and he'll ask a question every now and then and, and, we, just, and we just have good conversations. Well, him and his wife dropped by a while ago. They're on their way to um, Peoria, Illinois and um, they have been, they've, they've told themselves every time they go there, they're from Texas. And they've said, you know, we got to stop at Bethel. We got to stop at Bethel. We got to stop at Bethel. Well, they finally did it today. And uh, we just had a great, great time. They didn't stay very long. They're on the road. And, um, but anyway, it's just a joy to, to meet them and a joy to meet the people that uh, can come by here and, you know, tell us who they are. And, and uh, usually if I don't know their names, if I don't recognize their names, Alicia will pop up and say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm the one that sends you your packets, or I'm the one that does this. I'm the Alicia knows everybody. And, uh, but anyway, it was a joy to, to meet with them uh, this afternoon. We had prayer. They've got some needs there they wanted me to pray about. And so we had prayer upstairs. I took their picture in front of that green wall. Ain't no telling what I'm going to do with it, but I told them I'd send it back to them. But anyway, uh, let's just bow for a minute and let's tell God thank you. Okay, he's been faithful to this church. Very faithful to this church. And, uh, and I believe it's because we've always had a willing heart um, to take the things that God has blessed us with and to always use it for his honor, his glory, and, and his kingdom. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I come to you Lord, and I thank you, God, for uh, the, the family we got to meet today. And Lord, what a blessing it was. And uh, just spending some time with, uh, with people and talking with them and, and uh, just, uh, just, just getting to know them. Lord, we love you and we, we thank you, Lord, for all the people that you have blessed us with here at, at Bethel. And we thank you, God, for uh, opening up all the opportunities that you have opened up for us. The blessing, the blessing to, to undertake the privilege to feed your sheep. Lord, there's nothing better that we can do than feed your sheep. And Father, we love doing it. I love hearing the testimonies. I love seeing the pictures and the people, Lord, who have absolutely nothing I've been to their dwelling places I've seen where they live I've seen where they spend the hours of their daytime and father I just I give you praise tonight so father I pray dear God that you would always continue uh, to bless our church just so that Lord we can take the blessings that you've given us and turn those around and be a blessing to the people, Lord, whom you love, the people whom you send our way, the people that, Lord, we know that there are some deep, deep, deep needs in their life. And, and food and water is just, uh, just the very tip of the iceberg of the things that these people need. And so, Father, we, we thank you, God, for giving us the privilege to feed your lambs and to feed your sheep. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that as we prepare to feed folks tomorrow there in Turkana, Lord, that you would bless it, bless it with a mighty blessing. And Father, I could, I could even ask you, God, and believe, Lord, that you can do this. That, Lord, if... if uh, if 5,000 people show up and we've got enough food for 3,000, God, would you bless it like you did in days of old where the woman gathered up and borrowed all of the cruises of, of, that had no oil in it and God, you filled every single one of them, Lord, with just one little cruise of oil. You filled every one of them. Father, I, I believe you're the miracle-working God. 
Lord, you, I, you did it before. I believe you can do it again. And Lord, I, I would just ask, God, that you do a miracle this week uh, for the people of Turkana and for your glory. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the people that came by today. And I pray, Lord, you'd bless them in their travel and their journeys. And uh, Father, just bless us tonight as we open up your word and see things, Father, the way uh, your word lays it out to us. Give us understanding, give us depth of knowledge, increase our faith. And Lord, just have mercy on us tonight as we open up your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen, amen. Now, Acts chapter 1, let me go back here. We'll start at verse 1. Uh, of the book of Acts, and uh, boy, I'm telling you, God's a miracle-working God, amen? He is. Now, and I'm going to say this tonight, if, if I never in this life see another miracle, if I, if I, if I do not in this lifetime see another miracle that God has done, I, I, I have but to just open up God's word and see the miracles that he has done that they're written down for us. And I would still believe that that, that same God exists. That same God is just as powerful as he was back then. That same God is a miracle working God. And like I said, if he, if he never did another miracle from here until the day I depart this world and go to glory, I'll still believe him. Uh, the way I do now, I, I still believe him as if he had raised my family back from the dead and gave them life again. I would still believe in that God. I trust him and I trust his word. And if I need a miracle to help me out, all I have but to open the scriptures. And there's page after page after page of miracles and miracles and miracles and things that God has done. Somebody say amen to that. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, uh, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but, and here we have the words of Christ uh, that are in red. By the way, I'm going to throw this in real quick. I, um, Lisa watches, um, I don't know if it's uh, Facebook or whatever, but there's a gal on Facebook that she follows, and this gal used to be a, uh, a Pennsylvania Dutch Amish young lady. She was, she was born and bred into the Amish community. And um, I don't know exactly what all led to it, but I know that at some point she left that community. And let me tell you something. Uh, if you were saved as a result of this church, and after about four or five years, five to ten years, ten, fifteen years, doesn't matter, uh, all of a sudden, you decide that, you know, maybe this church ain't for you and you go to a different church. I'm here to tell you that just by leaving this church, that does not condemn you to go to hell. Your salvation did not come from me. Therefore, I cannot take it away. It was not granted to you by any of the hands laid on you in this church. Therefore, those hands cannot take away your salvation. Somebody say amen. And uh, so that's one of the differences between us and just about every other thing out there is that they believe they tell them, boy, if you boy, if you leave us now, if you leave us. Well, you'll just be in the wilderness and you just lose your salvation. And that is not that's not biblical. But anyway, she left the Amish community and uh, she said that now when it comes to the to the Bible, they've got a a German type Bible that they're taught that language in their Amish schools. They're taught the language of that Bible 
it, it's sort of, I don't think it's real German. I think it's like a derivative of German, maybe. But anyway, they're taught that, uh, and they only go up to eighth grade, by the way, in the Amish communities. That's it, eighth grade, no more, no high school, nothing. But anyway, they're taught to read that Bible. And this lady said that she knows, you know, she, she understood some of it and remembers some of it. But for the most part, that Bible was, was really never understood by her to any great degree. And that's exactly how they want it. They want it that way because uh, I, I was watching one family. They live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I want to tell you what, those, if you want to find Dutch Amish, they're in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I've been there. And uh, they, they don't like us English people very much, but they sure do like our money. That much I'll tell you. But anyway, um, uh, they, they, uh, there was one family out there that all of a sudden they started reading the King James Bible. And you know what they found out? That God didn't say anything in the Bible about how your suspenders were to be worn. God never said anything in the Bible about how you had to wear a hat outside all day long. And, and the type of hat. God never said any of the things that they made as their rules of salvation. So naturally, when this girl leaves the Amish community uh, and they shun her, according to them, she's going to hell and there ain't a thing that she can do about it. Because if she has, if she has been, if she's lost her membership in the, uh, the, the group of Amish that she's in, She's going to die and go to hell, period. That's it. Also, and I didn't know this, but they told her they had a King James Bible there and it had red letters in it. And they used it for an illustration. And she said, we're taught in our school houses that the red letters in the Bible were not, in fact, the words of Christ. They were made up words that man injected into the Bible to make it sound like Jesus said that, but Jesus did not say that. I'm going, listen, I, I got a theory that says, if you ever want to spot a cult, look at their doctrine on the Bible. Look at their doctrine on the Bible. And if their doctrine on the Bible is haywire and it's crazy, and it's absolutely nuts and insane. It makes no sense whatsoever. And you know it's wrong. Uh, you, you, might, you might have you a cult on your hands. That, and seeing these red letters made me think of that. So let me move on. But wait. Jesus said that. Wait. For the promise of the Father which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So now, um, that's what I have up on the screen, verse 5. And Jesus mentions, John did baptize you with water. And you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And that's it. As far as right here is concerned, that's it. However, turn to Matthew 3, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, this is John the Baptist, Jean Baptiste, pardon my French. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said, for John truly baptized with water. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, period. Right? No. And with fire. 
period, or colon. Whose fan is in his hand, what, what is he doing with this fan? What is this fan for? Huh? It's, win, it's a winnowing fan. Remember, remember when um, Ruth, yeah, remember when Ruth was told to seek out um, Boaz, the Redeemer, and her mother-in-law Naomi said, you will find him in the garner and he'll be winnowing barley because it was the barley harvest. So she goes and she looks and sure enough, there's this man in there and he is winnowing his barley. Now I guess we all know that whether it's wheat or barley or corn uh, or any of those seed grain products, uh, they all have on the outside the chaff, we call it. Um, it's, the, it's the shell, uh, which is no good. Why they decided to stick it in wheat bread, I don't, I don't get it. To me, it looks like somebody dropped the dough on the floor. And they just picked it up and they said, Oh, that looks good. We, I won't even flick that off. Okay? But anyway, um, the chaff is the shell that the, the germ on the inside and everything else that that seed needs to flourish when it first starts to come up out of the ground. That's the important part there. To make an analogy of us here tonight, the chaff is this flesh. What purpose does it serve? No good. No good. It is to be purged off. Now we have... Machines that do that now, if you've ever followed a combine or watched a combine, uh, they have a way of pulling all of the, uh, whether it's uh, out, if you go out in Indiana or Iowa, 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 yeah, Iowa, and corn in Iowa, she'll wake up in a minute, there we go, um, yeah, they have a way of, of getting that chaff off of there and get rid of it. It serves no purpose after that. It's dead. It's gone. It's the same way with this body. This body, once it is dead, it serves no purpose whatsoever. I am not afraid of, of someone finding me dead one day and... For whatever reason, they decide to, uh, they could bury me if they want to. They could donate every organ I have. They could give them my right arm, my left arm, my right left leg. I don't care what they give away. It doesn't bother me a bit in the world. I don't need it no more. Or if I was ever burned up in a fire or drowned in the ocean, or buried at sea. Uh, some people have, uh, I would say, a, a limited understanding of the resurrection. Does God need our bodies intact in order to resurrect our soul? Answers no. Paul said it, 1 Corinthians 13, Though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity. Uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham referred to himself as but dust and ashes. Is what, how he referred to himself as. And so if, if, the, if, if, I'm, if some people have a big thing. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, well, what was the word I used yesterday? I, I don't want to uh, bother somebody's conscience. If you feel like cremation is not right for you, then don't do it. But I'm here to tell you there is no condemnation in Scripture to those who have been cremated. None. There is no commandment from the Scripture that orders us 
to leave our body intact. Uh, there was a, um, a family in our church years ago. It was an older couple, and their son was dying. He had cancer, and he was dying. And I was there at the hospital, and um, they, uh, somebody from, I don't know what office, came by and was writing down, asked him if he had a living will, and they said no. And he said, well, I can arrange that now. Just need to ask a few questions. And they asked him while he was still alive, do, do you want to donate any of your organs um, for medical purposes or whatever? And he said, no, absolutely not. I don't want that. And his, his parents, who went to church here, agreed with him. And after that person left the room, they were talking about it. They didn't really ask me my opinion. Um, but they were just talking about it. And they were saying, you know, I, we, we, I believe that if God's going to resurrect us in the last days, he's going to need that body to resurrect it from. So they weren't going to allow any organ donations or anything. And they, and they had the idea that the body had to be intact. Well, listen, the way we embalm bodies nowadays, that at its best is only like 150, 200 years old. Uh, before that, it was a race to get that body in the ground before it started stinking too bad. And most people who were, especially poor people, they were just, they were not embalmed at all. They were just cast into the ground. And what would they turn into? Dust. And what is, and is there anything left? Let's say a thousand years from now. Is there anything left of that person's body? No. The shell is done away with. It's gone. So whether someone dies a death and they're buried or someone dies and they are cremated, it is irrelevant to God. God doesn't need the chaff to save what's on the inside. Amen? And that's what, and in fact, that's what, that's what Matthew 3 says. He says, uh, that He that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Very important that he said that. Very important. And with fire. He didn't say that in Acts at all. He said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He mentioned nothing about the fire. But here in Matthew 3, uh, you sh he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and with that fan, he's blowing away all of the chaff that used to be on there. He will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But what will he do to the chaff? Burn it up with unquenchable fire. Amen. So... Now, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In, in Luke chapter 3, 16, here's what he says. John answered and said unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist. But one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Says it again whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And let me ask you a question. If I say unquenchable fire, and then I say fire unquenchable, am I saying the same thing? Yeah. Okay. And I brought that up because when it comes to the majority what's called the majority text. There's over 5,000 Greek texts, either of partial or complete New Testament in Greek. When they talk about how there are differences from one text to another, it's stuff like this that they're referring to. Fire unquenchable is unquenchable fire. Even though... 
they said it differently they're saying the exact same thing that pales in comparison to comparing I, I don't know if any of the modern translations get this wrong but let's say that in the NIV in the English Standard Version that um, they didn't say anything about fire unquenchable or unquenchable fire so if you compare King James this verse but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable and let's say let's just pretend that the NIV says but the chaff he will burn and they stop right there okay which is really a significant difference the second example not the first okay and that's that is primarily what you're dealing with in any of the places where the majority text manuscripts disagree with one another it's stuff like that this word is here first and then this word but in another it this word is first and then this word and what I learned about Greek in the first month of Greek studies in Bible college was that the Greek sentences don't have a word order like we do with us it's noun verb and that's the basis of it and you have to have a word order for the sentence to make sense but in Greek it doesn't have that all right now so let me ask you a question tonight what is it what do you think it means what does it mean to you to be baptized with fire baptized with fire anybody anybody Kyle you got your hand raised Okay, I like that. That's, that's a pretty good analogy. When you, when you are saved and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then uh, what he said was, the Holy Ghost says, leave that flesh behind. Okay, I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, so that, that, could, that could be... Uh, a very that's that would be a very good uh, illustration of that all right somebody else yes Dave is there, yes he is correct that's right the Bible is very clear especially in the the letter of first John First John will teach you that the outer man is nothing but chaff and it belongs in the fire. Okay, it belongs in the fire. It also tells you that you have a new man inside of you. And again, I will, I will never forget hearing... Uh, Keith Crum mentioned this. His two twin brother sons have been studying the Bible, mostly in the wrong way, for years, but they studied it, they knew it, and they still, it took them, it took them years to come to this conclusion that Keith Crum got a hold of in less than a week the day that they went to get him out of the hospital they had to take him by the pharmacy to get his medicine and he told his sons he said boys I don't know how to say it but I feel like I have somebody living on the inside of me and when when Bradley told me that I just I smiled I laughed and I'm going <laughs> That's hilarious. And they're like, well, why? So you guys have been reading the Bible all your life. And it took you years to know that. Your dad figured it out in three days. Amen. Amen. You got somebody living on the inside of you. And uh, 
I mean, I, and I'll never forget his salvation. I led him to the Lord. He prayed that prayer. And I asked him, Keith, if you died today, where would you go? He said, I believe I'd go to heaven. Well, here comes the doctor in right after that saying, uh, we, we, you've got cancer. And it, it looks to us to be incurable. And, I, I'm, and I'm just like, what timing? Lord, what timing, you know? But anyway, so yeah, uh, burn, burn off this old flesh, get it out of the way so that uh, what really is going to live forever is that new man on the inside of us, all right? Somebody else, what is the, what is the uh, baptism of fire? Yes, John. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you mentioned something. I never really thought about this until just now when you were talking about that. But the number of ways that God describes that the, the old you is getting peeled off and left. I mean, how many different analogies? Number one, the chaff okay, is, being, is going to be blown off with a, mighty, rush, with a rushing mighty wind. It's going to be blown off, okay, and then it's going to be burnt with unquenchable fire. That's one, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way of looking at it, uh, what did I have in mind? I just lost it, man. I did. It was good, too. Uh, huh? Yeah. You got to put it in the fire and cool it, all, cool it down quickly, and it's tempered. Yeah, it's tempered. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just the different ways that God describes in the word. Uh, okay, I remember what it was now. Uh, when you melt down what gold you've got, what's, what's not gold comes to the top. That's dross. And you clear that scum off and get that dross off of there so that you've got as close to pure gold. There is no such thing as pure gold on this earth. But in heaven, it's pure enough to where you can see through it. Okay, that's going to be cool. Uh, but anyway, um, it, it's like the dross that's, that's, that's in, that is taken out because of the refiner's fire. It's like the chaff that is blown off and, and, and is burned up in unquenchable fire. Um, it just over and over. Oh, when Jesus said that uh, I am the vine and you are the branches and my father will, will, will purge the branch so that uh, it can produce more fruit and better fruit. It's always God, it's always God who is removing the things out of our life that do not bring Him honor and glory. It's always God doing it. Amen? So that just, that just hit me while you were saying that. Anybody else got a... Got a this, is, this is pretty good. Y'all make good teachers. Y'all listen, to maybe one of these... Days, I'll just take a Sunday off and let y'all have it. Yes, Melissa. And you're saying that's the baptism of fire? Okay. All right, yeah, that, that'll work. That'll work. Anybody else? I understand. Sure. Foreign languages, so they can reach everybody. So if the fire or two of the Holy Ghost, yep. You know, to do God's work, 
The tongues of fire definitely, I, I think, are... I think they're there as a foreshadow. Let me just, let me tell you what I, what I believe. That I'm going to give to the scripture. I believe that there is coming a day before we leave this world where you and I, if we are alive on that day, we will be baptized by fire. Okay? You might want to write that down that I that on April 17th at 7 minutes after 8 o'clock, way longer than, you know, than you should have been here, but we got started late, so... But anyway, I believe that one of the last things that will happen to all of us before we leave is that all of us, all of us will be baptized by fire. Now, let me give you sort of an idea of what I'm talking about. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3 and, and open your Bible up to these places. Mark it down, and then maybe you can write on there, baptism by fire, question mark. This is Pastor Mike being an idiot. What? And there you have it. This is Pastor Mike's stupidity. Okay? 1 Corinthians 3, 13. Now, there's a key word in this verse. It's the one, two, three, fourth word of this verse. Verse 13. What's the, what's the fourth, ver, fourth, fourth word of this verse? Shall, that's future tense. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Just to throw something else in here, uh, something that the board talked about uh, Sunday, this tree right behind um, the house over here, we call it the parsonage. It's supposed to be where the preacher lives. But uh, anyway, this tree over here is half dead and it's dangerous. So we're talking to some guys that are going to bring it down for us. Okay, they're going to they're going to cut it up and bring it down. Um, we're going to uh, keep the wood and uh, cut it up, get rid of the brush. And uh, if anybody needs the wood, you know, like if we have somebody in, in the church that has a fireplace or whatever and they live on that, uh, we, we can give them some wood or we'll, we'll just sell the wood. It, wood's, wood's expensive now. And uh, there's a lot of wood in that tree over there, okay? Um, where was I going with that? Oh! The thing I like to do when, it, when you cut a tree down is go look at the rings. The rings tell you the story of that tree, if you know how to read it. Number one, it'll tell you how many years old that tree is. My first remembrances of this church, the pastor, Pastor Brown, that lived in that house, he had a son that was exactly my age. And... Um, we became buddies, and he had him a tree house up in that tree. And I remember getting to go to his house, and we would climb up in that tree. He had little steps going up to it, and we would just sit and play up in that tree. That was one of my early remembrances of that. And it's a fond, fond memory, okay? I, so part of me doesn't want to burn the tree down or take the tree down. But anyway, when we cut the tree down, you'll be able to look... And you'll see, sometimes you'll see small areas between the rings. Sometimes you'll see larger areas between the rings. What does that indicate? Drought or have they had a lot of rain? Uh, sometimes you'll see um, where the tree has got a dark ring around it. What does that indicate? There was a fire that went through and the tree survived it. Okay, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the coal, the chard parts of that tree remained on there and the tree grew over that so the whole story of that tree is right there okay and so what happens is that we reveal the story of that tree by cutting it down 
Okay? So here, it's, it's sort of like the same thing. It, um, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. What will happen is, this old body, this dross, this um, uh, chaff is going to be burnt off. And what is really on the inside of that person, that's what counts, isn't it? What did, what did God tell Samuel about picking one of Jesse's sons to be king? You, you're, uh, Samuel, you're looking on the outside. I look on the inside. And I'm telling you, it's none of these guys. Okay? It, it's, it's not the biggest one. It ain't the tallest one. It ain't the best looking one. And so that caused Samuel to say to uh, uh, Jethro and say, what, what, do you have any more sons? Yeah, I got one. He's out tending sheep. Well, get him over here. And, and he anointed him, poured oil all over him. He anointed him as the next king. But it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall, again, pre, pa, future tense, shall try every work, every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You didn't know that the Bible said you'll be saved by fire. That's what baptism is. So let's, let's say that the water in the baptistry is not water. Well, we know God's not going to flood the earth again, right? So let's say that that's fire. And that person's work has been purified off. Fire is a purifier, isn't it? Okay, it purifies things, it burns things off that shouldn't be there and so on. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So I believe that it is something yet to take place. 2 Thessalonians 1, turn there. I know I'm keeping you a little bit, but I just want to, I want to get you to think about this. 2 Thessalonians 1. Oh, oh, I like this. All the people. Matthew, all the people that made fun of you because you were a Christian. They're going to get it one of these days. OJ got it. OJ got it. I've said that for years. He didn't get by with anything. He didn't get by. He didn't get away with murder. The real judge, he's not stood before yet, but he did now. He stood before the real judge. And that judge judges with righteous judgment. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And you might want to underline the word tribulation and the word trouble in your Bible. Because the two of them go together. If you want to study tribulation, study the word trouble in the Bible. Trouble, troubled, troublings. Uh, any variation of that. Because tribulation is trouble. And it troubles us. Verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's our rapture. In flaming fire. Look at that. Taking vengeance. Uh, who was it that said something about the wrath of God? Was that? Yeah. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. Taking vengeance on 
all the Bidens that know not God, all the Epsteins, all of the, uh, oh, who was that Hollywood guy that got busted and thrown in prison for, huh? Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein all these Jews. Yeah. And then uh, what rap star are they going after now? Yeah. Anyway, listen, all of them, they're going to get what's coming. If they sold their soul, they're going to pay the price. And to me, it's a dumb thing to sell your soul to Satan. He already has it. He already has it. But anyway, um, the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So, verse 8, in flaming fire. Verse uh, 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. That is the rapture, is what that is. So, Jesus comes then. Okay, John baptized with water under repentance. Jesus baptizes in the Holy Ghost. And now, when he comes again, he's going to baptize us in fire. Okay? So, keep all of that in mind. Because next Wednesday, we'll have a little fun. I, I'm going to show you what I think is going to happen. All right?